This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. You may be surprised to find out that you can legally have the Bible taught during public school as a course option for any student. Today we talk to Joel Penton. He's known as a defensive end that in 2003 created a one-of-a-kind evangelistic event featuring then Ohio State coach Jim Trestle. Today, Joel is spearheading the effort to bring Bible classes to public schools. I'm gonna find out more about this program that's changing the lives of our children. But first, I wanna to get to know more about Joel and why he used the Ohio State football program as a platform to share the gospel. Do you really think that I'll go to Ohio State, I can play football there, and I'm really gonna be able to express my, my Christianity? Well, I could see that that was gonna be, you know, I could see the power of Ohio State mm -hmm. and, and the brand and, you know, sure. there's so many fans and that type of thing. And so that, that was a big driving factor in why I chose to go there. And it is amazing, though, even to this day. I mean, for goodness sake, I played more than 10 years ago, and I still find myself speaking um, from the platform of a former Ohio former State Ohio football State. player. It just has that much staying power. Right. It's remarkable. It is. Well, it is. It is quite a brand, and you 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 wear a ring from a national championship <laughs> team. So that doesn't. Just an aside. I got to. Was there any any calls from the team up north? You know, I um, <laughs> received a letter from Michigan, mm -hmm. and you it said was it. I did it, it, the the state up north, <laughs> and it was addressed to Joel Painter. Uh, so they got my last name wrong. I said, "Oh, that's probably no, pretty uh, typical yeah. for them." But a lot of things happening at Ohio State at that time. How did, how did uh, I mean, you come in there as a freshman. Mm -hmm. You actually, uh, did you redshirt as a freshman? I redshirted yeah. and then, um, and the, yeah, then played the following four. How did, how did a team, I mean, Ohio State draws men from all walks of life, all cultures, all over the United States. How, how were you accepted there as a, as a were you an upfront Christian? I mean, you, did they accept you as, as, as that? Yeah, I, I wore it on my sleeve and I mm -hmm. engaged in as many conversations as I could with teammates and I, I found it to be a really positive experience. Guys had different perspectives and different beliefs and, and were living their lives different ways, but there was a much um, more healthy respect for one another. And so I found that while never, not everyone agreed with me, um, some of the guys on the team would even come to me for advice yeah. and wanting to hear, you know, what's the, what's the Christian point of view? And, and truth is there was a good core group of fellow Christians mm -hmm. on the team. It did help. And, and at the time, you were out using that platform to speak even as a college player, right? I mean, during the, your college years. Yeah, I, I tried to take any opportunity I could. Um, you know, as, an, as a player, we got invitations all the time to, you know, sure. read books at local elementary schools, speak at banquets, this and that. And uh, maybe some guys saw it as um, a distraction or a burden or something. But if, if it was an opportunity for me to share the gospel, I, I tried you, you to take that. advantage. What did the coaching staff think? I mean, what was the relationship with Coach Trestle at that time as a it, Christian? Well, you know, Coach Trestle, he was the head coach for yeah. Ohio State. So he and I had a good relationship in that um, when we would talk, we would talk about biblical things and we would talk about life. And um, but, but he was the head coach, so it was hard to spend a lot of time yeah, with sure. him. He was pulled in so many different directions. But the coaches created, when I was there, uh, a great environment that there were uh, ministry guys in our facility and opportunities for Bible study. Well, yeah, and, and with all that the community involvement, going out and talking and, and, and reading books to kids and things like that, you were the, uh, the winner of the Warfel Trophy. Yeah. I, explain that. I mean, some people say that that's... That, that's equivalent to the Heisman in community service and academics and, and athletic ability. That's, that's a pretty amazing thing. Well, I mean, it's, it was a huge honor. And, you know, to this day, I'm kind of surprised. Yeah. I, I go every year to the ceremony to be part of giving sure. it to the next guy, and I kind of feel like I don't fit in. Like, well, I can't believe I was actually chosen for this thing. Um, it was something I didn't know about. It was a fairly new award. Yeah. I was only the second winner I of know, the yeah. award. Mm -hmm. But we, it was 2006. We were, have, we were undefeated at that point. Our quarterback won the Heisman. And so everybody's getting nominated for every, mm -hmm. you know, all these awards under the sun. And lo and behold, I was fortunate enough yeah. to win that one. Well, the trophy has a, was an engraving of Danny Warfel praying mm -hmm. after a touchdown. Right. How'd that make you feel then? I mean, that, I mean, once you realize that this is impactful, I mean, this is another Christian that this is named after, and the guy who's doing great work at that, that time with Desire Street Ministries, and uh, how'd that make you feel is it, going back into the locker room and saying, I, I won this? Yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty amazing. I mean, to this day, I'm, I'm 
just humbled by the yeah. opportunity. I remember getting a call. The, the way I found out, well, I got a call from Danny. I was called into Coach Trestle's office to take a phone call, and it was Danny Warfall You didn't know it at the time. No, no. <laughs> I had heard that I was a finalist, but yeah. uh, I got this call. Uh, you know, I received this phone call from Danny Warfall, and by the time I was done with practice later that day, I had a voicemail from Mike Ditka on my phone, who was... <laughs> That's pretty heady stuff. ...who was involved um, in the early days, and so... Yeah, it's been exciting, and now some yeah. of those uh, other former winners are honestly some of my best friends. We see each other once a year. It's a great fraternity. And one of the uh, the finalists this year would have been uh, in the in 2020 season was Master Teague. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another Ohio State player. So it, it's just it, it, it's it's a special thing, yeah. and we it's it's been fun to see Ohio State players from time to time make that uh, semifinal list and then the finalists. And I'm a voter now, to, so I get to see a little bit of that, and I'm yeah. anxious for the day. Uh, we get to see another Buckeye. Another Buckeye won it. Well, we're going to talk about what's happening in your life since that time because exciting stuff's happening, uh, especially in the last, last few years. I mean, you, you were out there as a speaker, mm -hmm. been an author of two books, mm -hmm. uh, Seven Lies that, that Most Teenagers Believe, right. and the other one is Stand Up. So Stand Up is the basis of what your motivational speaking is? Yeah, so yeah. the two books kind of represent, they really represent my speaking ministry. Stand mm -hmm. Your Ground is the message Stand of my school, right? Okay. And that's all right, is the message of my school assembly, which is all about mm -hmm. keeping commitments, making commitments, but keeping them. And that's the character based message I share in school assemblies during the day. I'm not able to share the gospel. Right. So that book is very motivational and about character and commitment. And then my book, Seven Lies Almost Every Teen Believes is all about the gospel. And mm -hmm. it's just about the fact that we're living in this world and we're receiving messages, really sermons, honestly, from all these different sources, whether it's television, social media, friends, mm -hmm. whatever it is. And most of the things that we're told day in and day out are not true. I mean, they are lies. Yeah. They're expressing a worldview yeah. that isn't in line with the truth. And so it's walking students to scripture, to the gospel, and it represents kind of the evening outreach we do after school assemblies mm -hmm. where we're able to share the gospel. Yeah. yeah, we want to talk about that worldview and when that worldview is set in a, in a child's mind and, and in a little bit. But one last thing is we, we, we kind of wrap up your, your college days. The main event, that was, yeah. a, that, was, that was a huge surprise for everybody, I think, wasn't it? It was. Tell me about how, how that all came to fruition. Yeah, so the main event was an event we did my senior year at Ohio State. I said, what if we open this up to the whole community? To everybody. And so we rented out St. John Arena, the old basketball mm -hmm. arena, sure. contacted churches. And, and that was another thing that it all happened so fast. And it was during the football season. And some teammates and I spoke and Coach Trestle spoke. And wouldn't you know, wow. more than 13,000 people came <laughs> and, uh, and heard the gospel. We, I mean, it was a capacity crowd Phenomenal. at St. John. And uh, yeah, that was definitely a, a highlight. Phenomenal time. Yeah. And, and yeah, but it's a, it's a, it's a state college. And you, you're allowed to do you're, you're in a public university right you're allowed to do that yeah yeah, yeah. i mean we we're running the place and we're individuals yeah we yeah. approached them as athletes in action sure. and said how can we rent this and and uh, and god blessed it you know yeah. and we've to this day we um uh, someone recently came up to me in a parking lot this is just within the last year and said are you joel penton and i said yeah and he <laughs> said he said back in 2006 I was at the main event in St. John Arena, and my life has been different wow. ever since then. I just want to thank you. <laughs> this is in a parking lot in Dublin, Ohio. And so anyway, it's, it, was, it was pretty yeah. exciting. So what's next after what many believe would be your career high point at Ohio State? For Joel, it's creating a program that's bringing Bible classes back to public schools. In a moment, I'm going to ask him the details on this incredible project. Not only can you watch Viewpoint each week, but you can also listen to it on demand as a podcast. You can go to WTLW.com and under videos, click Viewpoint, and you'll see the selection of interviews. You can also subscribe by searching for Viewpoint with Bob Placey on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. And remember to share the podcast with your friends. When you look at the, what, what you've encountered with, with middle school kids, sociologists tell us that their worldview is pretty much solid by the time they hit 13. Mm -hmm. you, you find in kids that uh, really even know what their world, worldview is? Yeah, I mean, just in the last 10 years that I've been in ministry, to see 
worldview shift to much more secular. Um, yeah. You know, kids these days, they don't have... When I came to Christ, maybe I hadn't heard the gospel clearly, but I had a lot of the foundational pieces in mm -hmm. place that I was able to make sense you believe of there the was gospel. A God. There was a God, and, and He created the universe. Right. And, yeah. and so there's a lot of those pieces aren't even in place now for students. You know, they don't know the Bible has two testaments. Um, so you're really starting much further back when you go to explain the gospel. Yeah, we talked with George Barna, who's a researcher. He had mentioned that uh, in 1996, his research showed that there was uh, like 9 to 12 percent of Americans had a Christian worldview. Mm -hmm. This past year, it's down to about 6 percent. So 6 wow. percent of American homes, or 6 percent of Americans, had that Christian worldview. How do you break through that when you're hitting a middle school kid in the evening after you've talked to them during the day? How are you getting them to come back and hear what a real Christian worldview is? Well, thankfully, the gospel and the Word of God is powerful and effective. Mm -hmm. And, you know, no matter how far the, you know, no matter how little someone knows, and while there's clearly much education that needs to take place at some point, hearts are changed by the gospel. Yeah. And so as break through you, that concrete of an old, of a, another world worldview. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, people hear the gospel and hearts are changed, lives are changed. And so we still see that life change, but you're right. It's, it's getting messier and messier. Mm -hmm. But you're, you're used to now uh, working in and, and with the, the, the public school system. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've been a motivational speaker now for how long? It's Quite been 13 while. years. Quite a while. Quite yeah. a while. <laughs> and so you've been working with a lot, of, a lot of school administrators, a lot of principals. You go back to your home school and you see a, a program called Cross Over the Hill. Right. What, what did that send off in, in your head? What, tell me about that, that, that whole program because this is different for a, for a school system. Yeah, I was introduced to this program, Cross Over the Hill in Van mm -hmm. Wert, which started after I had left Van Wert. It started in 2012. I didn't know much about it. I had moved away. Yeah. I'd heard about it. And then I got introduced to what it really was. Well, you had heard about it for you. I, I heard it. about it, but I knew so mm -hmm. little about it. I, and honestly, yeah. I, I just, I didn't know much. Mm -hmm. And then I came to, to be introduced to what it really was, what released time Bible education is, and what was happening with Cross Over the Hill. <laughs> and as a guy who's in ministry to reach yeah. public Kids. school yeah. students, I mean, my mind was blown and I've been, and. Uh, my mind's been blown ever since. What were they doing? Because you mentioned release time, and we want to talk about that specifically. But what were what was were they doing in Van Wert that was different than anything you'd seen before? Well, they were doing release time, and, and so release time religious instruction—that's the legal term—is mm -hmm. this practice of students being released from public school during the school day to receive religious instruction. So it's not an after-school program. Not after school. Not yeah. before school. It's during the day. <laughs> to receive. And we can do that? <laughs> right. That's what, and I, that's what I said. That's what everybody says. There's no way this is, this is real. But, but it is. It's been around for over 100 years. The Supreme Court ruled on it in 1952. And Ohio, as well as more of half the states in the nation, have passed laws specifically about release time. In the state of Ohio, high school students can get school credit for release oh, time classes. Really? But... Almost no one knows about this. Well, the, the schools aren't really, you know, reporting on it. They're, they're not going to tell a lot of people about it. I mean, it kind well, of causes some issues, doesn't it? Well, schools? and schools don't know about it. I mean, so now we'll meet with principals and superintendents, they and they know. have policies in their school board manuals about release time that they don't even know are there because it's come down from the state and it's been rubber stamped into their manuals. And so these laws are on the books, but people just don't know. And then you have something like Van Wert mm -hmm. that can go to show, wow, the impact potential here in this ministry of release time is huge. And if we, if we attack it correctly, it can change the next generation. How did they even begin it and start it in Van Wert? So in Van Wert in 2012, mm -hmm. They learned that this was possible, and they bought a home directly adjacent to the elementary school. That's an investment. Yep. They, uh, they raised the money. They converted it into two classrooms, and they started signing kids up. Now, for the program to be legal, it has to be off school grounds, okay. privately funded, and have parental permission. In year one, about 60% of students signed wow. up. Of by the year, elementary school? Of the elementary school, grades one through five. And wow. this is what's incredible. By year three, 95% <laughs> of the student <laughs> body nearly 700 students, almost every single student in Van Wert Elementary School now, grades one through five, is taught the Bible each and every week. If you grew up in Van Wert, Ohio, and you're a public school student, chances are part of your culture, part of your life is being taught 
the Bible now since 2012. It's really incredible. And these are volunteers or uh, teaching the Bible? Are they trained? I mean, so, when you're releasing your kids to religious education, wouldn't the parents get a little bit edgy about that? Well, uh, who's teaching it and how they're teaching it? 95% of parents aren't edgy they, about they, it. They, I mean, they're they signing they their kids up. It. Yeah, and so the, there's paid teachers. You know, they're paid a modest wage. Mm -hmm. You know, um, okay. they have classes all day long because they come in groups of classes. And, wow. and then there's volunteer chaperones and, and a board and all of that. So if a, if a child starts pre-kindergarten or kindergarten or first grade, whenever they start, and they go through that, that whole, th the whole thing at that time, cross over the hill, what would they have heard or been exposed to by the time they get into high school? Well, uh, the, so the curriculum has changed some. I mean, they okay. pr are pretty much walk through the Bible, and now that is our curriculum. We have a licensing agreement with the Gospel Project that we take students grades one through five through the entire Bible, Genesis to Revelation, over the course of five years, every lesson along the way. Again, Genesis to Revelation, mm -hmm. we connect it to how does it fit into the bigger picture of the gospel. And so by the time a kid now is graduating fifth grade, they've been through the Bible and they've heard the gospel each and every week. You're a speaker in high school, you say, well, or in middle school and high school, and you're, you're looking at this and say, wow. How, how can we maybe replicate this? How can I get it? What, what was going through your mind? I mean, probably happening fast again, but what was going through? God right. does a lot of things fast in your life. Doesn't it? <laughs> it seems how, like it. How did you, what was going through your mind at the time when you, when you looked across over the hill and you started thinking, we can, we can do this? Well, yeah. I mean, I immediately thought, why isn't this everywhere? Yeah. You know, I didn't know it was possible, but when it was clearly possible and having such an impact, I thought every single community across this nation needs a program like this. How do we make that happen? And that is really how LifeWise Academy was born. As I started interacting with the leadership there in Van Wert, uh, we kind of have merged our ministries yeah. and we said, let's create a model because people don't know about this and they don't have the tools mm -hmm. to get it done. So let's create a model, let's create the tools, and then let's send that out across the nation and see these things pop up everywhere. Because it's, it really is have been underground. I mean, you mentioned two other schools in that same county Mm -hmm. that had this program for years and nobody knew about it. Right. There's just a handful of schools across Ohio. Ohio has, I think, 700 plus mm -hmm. school districts. There's just a handful of schools that have programs like this. Mm -hmm. And so, we, yeah, it's, we think it's up to us to, to put the pieces together and to get the word out and see it replicated. Get the word out. It's, it's easier than we think maybe to get the gospel into, into public school children's hands. What, what did your staff, I mean, you got a, a small staff. What, how, when you went back and started talking about this, what kind of flames started going on? Well, um, of course. Say, yeah, we got plenty to do. Well, <laughs> this I, is impossible. I, I tend to be the visionary guy. I tend to be, you know, driven by ideas, mm -hmm. and I have these grand plans. Sure. And so, it, it, of course, you know, my staff is like, oh, okay, here, <laughs> here, here we go again. Yeah. Um, but as we really unpack the potential, it doesn't take long for people to see the reality that this is a legitimate path for, mm -hmm. for each and every community. There can be, you know, in Van Wert, there's over now 700 students in the program. Th that would wow. be, just think of if that were a church, you know, how many people that is each and every week mm -hmm. being taught the Bible and the dollars it takes and the time it takes to operate it while it takes some dollars and it takes some time. It's nothing compared to a church of that size. I mean, the bang for the buck and energy and resources is huge. Well, and the audience, to reach that audience mm -hmm. with, with, uh, with the gospel is, is very difficult in other, other situations. Absolutely. I mean, the Kids public... Kids are tired of playing games and everything else that's going on in their life, and they don't... But here in the middle of school, they slow down, and the gospel's coming in. There's no distraction. Absolutely. It's getting harder and harder to reach kids in before school programs and after school programs. Mm -hmm. It's too much uh, to do. It's getting harder and harder to, the, the public school system is a mission field, but because of all the rules and regulations, it can feel like an inaccessible mm -hmm. mission field. Some people feel like it's easier to get on a plane and go to Africa to reach people yeah. than to get into their public schools. Little do they know there's laws on the books that can enable them to do just that. So how fast has Likewise Academy grown now? I mean, you, you merged with what was going on in Van Wert, cross mm -hmm. over the hill. How fast has that grown since that, that point in time? I mean, to develop curriculum and processes and, and teacher requirements, things like that, how, does it, how, how is that fast has that grown and come together? 
Well, it, it, it feels like it's all happened very fast. Yeah. We, ha of course, had to raise a bunch of money because we had to hire staff and we had to develop curriculum yeah. and, and all those things. Right out of the gate, we found a couple communities that this past, so this has only been going on for a couple of years. In 2018 is when, when these ideas began. Mm -hmm. This past fall in 2019, we launched two brand new LifeWise locations so that we had one in Van Wert one in Ayersville, Ohio, and one in Conesville, Ohio, near Coshocton. Mm -hmm. And then we've developed a three-phase launch plan that we have a couple dozen communities working their way through. We were going to launch four to five this coming fall, but of course, yep. there's a pandemic. Yeah. So we'll be launching two more. So as of this coming school year, we'll have five locations with a couple dozen on the same path. What's that launch look like? I mean, what are the requirements? You said you got you got some places in phase one, phase two, mm -hmm. and then startup. What is that? What do those phases look like? I mean, how long is it going to take a, a school system to get this up and going? Well, it can vary greatly. Mm -hmm. So if it's a more challenging area, let's say a large school district that doesn't have a school board policy, that doesn't have a lot of the pieces in place, it could take over a year. So you've got to get it through the school board to start with. I mean, they've got right. to see it written in their policy. They've got right. to know what the law is. But over, here's the thing, over 60% of school districts in the state of Ohio already have something on their books because when the law was passed, many of these sample policies made it into mm -hmm into school board documents. Mm -hmm. And so that's a piece. And then, you know, the size of the school district, the logistics, it, there's a lot of factors. But if a lot of the pieces are in place, for example, if there's a nearby facility, maybe a church across the street, mm -hmm. um, if the school administration is very easy to work with and there's already a policy, we feel like in a matter of months, a program can get off the ground. So do you go where you're invited or do you go where you think this is a, a likely target? A little bit of both. I mean, it's we are kind of have, we're educating people that this is possible mm -hmm. at the same time as really working to help people launch it. So as we educate, people come to the surface, they say, hey, we should do this. We need to do this in our community. And then we help equip them to get it started. We already have introductions to a lot of administrators around the, right. around the state and around this part of the country with your, with your speaking. So there are people that may be open to, to hearing what you've got to say, but you've, if they've got to get it through there, then they've got to, do they hire their own teachers? for this program or did you put them onto teachers or are you training teachers? How does that sounds like a big logistics uh, situation? You know, it can seem that way, but that's why we've tried to put in all the work to handle many of those administrative details. It is a local decision on who the teacher is and the hiring process is very much local, but we've put a lot of the systems in place in yeah. terms of the application process, the vetting process. We help communities through it. We try to take all that administrative burden out of mm -hmm. there. So the people who have the heart to, to get it done are able to get it done easily. So results, what, what, I mean, f going from what Van Wert saw and, and the testimonials of those teachers and parents, what are you looking for in results? What have you heard and, and what, do you, what do you expect to see? Sure, well, our primary result that we're looking for is for students to hear the gospel yeah. and students to be exposed to the word of God because we believe and we know that the word of God changes hearts and so if we can get it to students life change will happen and and we're seeing that i mean i could we could go story after story i think about a little boy uh, from conesville uh, who's in that ministry that day one for some reason his parents signed him up but day <laughs> one he he's heard that they were going to pray and he said we don't pray in my house and by by week three or four he was inviting his classmates to come with him. And he eventually told his teacher, he said, um, he said, I don't know if my mom is going to allow me to come here anymore because she said coming to this program is changing me. And so <laughs> it's really... <laughs> He's going to become the preacher to their family. <laughs> right, right. And so, you know, and that's what the Word of God does. Yeah. It, it changes hearts. Van Wert's had it for a while. What have they seen in the school system itself? I mean, with these students that are 700 students, has it changed even the classroom? Well, that's what, that's what the teachers, that's what the um, people in the school system mm -hmm. are saying. I mean, the, um, the superintendent, uh, the woman who was the superintendent when it got started, uh, she's one of the biggest advocates. She's no longer, she retired. Mm -hmm. She's one of the biggest advocates for the program, the change she saw in the students. And uh, we know that the, the teachers, and I was in a meeting with uh, one of the administrators who said, listen, whatever you guys are doing over there, we love it. We love Keep it. it going. Keep it going. Yeah. Has there been any backlash from communities or from sta school staff that are concerned about 
I don't know, teachers' unions, they're concerned about separation, that, those types of things. Have you had any backlash from that? It's been very minimal, just mm -hmm. a couple voices here and there. What's so nice is that the law is so clear. Okay. You can just look it up mm -hmm. and say, this is what a release time program should look like. Is it off school grounds? Is it privately funded? Do they have parental permission? There's nothing really left to say. It's, it's clear cut. So what's the flight path then? What, what, what do you see this thing doing? Is it, it's, it's, you're in Ohio. Mm -hmm. How does somebody get this started in Indiana, Pennsylvania? Do you do it? Do other groups do it? Are you looking for clones? Are you looking for to just expand your, your part of the ministry? What do, what do you see the flight path of this whole thing? Well, I think our flight path is, yes, to, to replicate. You know, we did two this past year mm -hmm. and learned a lot. We're doing a few more now and learning more, but we hope to get to the point that we're able to launch many every year. So if there's anyone watching who mm -hmm. is interested in seeing this in their community or even yeah. just asking questions, how might we pursue this in the mm -hmm. community? Contact us. There, We've been able to identify many of the factors, the key factors that, or the obstacles that we would need to um, cover yeah. uh, to overcome to make it happen. Have you seen anybody else in, in, in the United States, any other similar uh, startups, any place that's, that's contacted you and said, hey, we're doing similar things? Not really, and that's one of the reasons we started it. When I first learned of release time, I thought, I need to find somebody that's doing it's this. already doing it. Right. Somebody has to be doing it someplace. Yeah, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. Let's link arms with somebody that's doing it, that's gospel-centered and doing it with excellence. And it was in coming to the conclusion that, that it's not really out there. Mm -hmm. We concluded, number one, that's why we think this hasn't grown and very few people know about it. And number two, I guess we have to do it. <laughs> if somebody's got to start it. It's got to, right. What else do you need to really keep that going? Well, the, the kind of two things we've been saying is we need connectors and we need funders. So mm -hmm. we need people to make the connection, say, uh, or, or, or simply doers. You know, if you're in a sure. community that you'd say, hey, I could, I could do this, then contact us. Let's do it. If you're somebody that thinks this sounds really great, but isn't maybe going to be the doer, but you can connect, mm -hmm. we need you to ma help make those connections. And of course, like many ministries, it's going to take a few dollars to do it. So we need funders. Are they, you looking these to be, these to be funded locally? Yes. Rather yeah. than a national ministry and then money goes out locally, we see it funded locally uh, yep. as far as the facilities and the teaching and, and uh, the, everything that goes with that, providing curriculum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have a national support center that we provide resources and do a lot of the administrative work, but then the program itself uh, functions, is maintained, and is funded locally. And so anybody who has any interest could contact us to receive that information. I know many of you are surprised that it's possible to have a Bible course offered at a public school. Well, education is critical to our culture, and I'd like to encourage you to find out more about LifeWise Academy. They have more information and videos so you or your church can get involved. I'd also like to encourage you to get involved with Viewpoint. This program has no advertising. So if you like what you've heard today, consider supporting us monthly with a financial gift at WTLW.com. And thanks for watching. Remember, you can watch the interviews you've seen today on demand on YouTube. Plus, you can also listen to all of our episodes on the Viewpoint with Bob Placey podcast on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you listen to a podcast.